Good morning, everyone. I'm Asma Badrawi from the Caripus Research Lab at the University of Minnesota. And I'm going to talk about applying recommendation techniques in the field of higher education. So in this domain, we have a university that consists of multiple colleges and departments, and each student enrolls in a college, declares a major, and he gets to select courses from a large variety of courses in order to fulfill his degree requirements. Hopefully, he's going to be taking courses that he likes and he's expected to perform well at. An automated course recommendation can help students find relevant courses given what they have taken so far, and it can also help them make informed decisions about future course enrollments. So when it comes to course recommendation, there are two main tasks that we need to consider. The first one is top end course ranking in which given a student and a variety of courses that he's eligible to take in the next term, we would like to select the end most relevant courses to this student and return it for him to consider taking in the next term. The second task has to do with grade prediction in which given a student in a course that he considers taking in the, in the next term, we would like to predict his, his grade in that course prior to enrollment. And recommendation techniques can be applied in this field by mapping the students to users and the courses to items and grades to ratings. And there's also the student and course academic features that describe some stuff like the student majors and academic levels at the time of taking the different courses. And it also describes the course subjects and levels. And although there's a lot of recommendation techniques in the literature, this data has special characteristics that needs to be accounted for. So we did an analysis on a large student course data that was obtained from the University of Minnesota in order to understand these characteristics and they can be summarized in a few points. The most important and most obvious point is that students with certain academic features tend to enroll in courses of, cert of certain features. So for example, students of certain majors and academic levels tend to enroll in courses of certain subjects and levels. And this is what we refer to as the grouping structures in the data. And this actually indicates that the enrollment patterns in a given student course matrix is largely determined by the student and course features. And that creates a not missing at random data. There are techniques in the literature that can model not missing at random data, such as response aware matrix factorization. However, it does not model it in terms of the user and item features. There are other matrix factorization methods that incorporate the user and course I'm sorry, the user and item features into the, the recommendation models. However, they do not model the grouping structures in the data in terms of these features. So what we did in this, in this work is that we said, okay, since students of certain features tend to enroll in courses of certain features, let's just use the features to define student and course groups. So the set of all courses can be divided into different groups based on the course subjects, and these can be further refined based on the course levels, for example. And similarly, the set of all students can be divided into different groups of stu students based on the, the student majors, and they can be refined based on, let's say, the academic levels. And as you can see, these groups can be defined at various levels of granularity, and of course, the finer groups are more homogeneous, but they are usually associated with less data points. And then we're going to use these groups for great prediction and top end course ranking as follows. The main idea is that the grade of a certain student S in some course C would be predicted based on how other students in the same group as S performed in C and how S himself has performed in other courses that are in the same group as C. Top end course ranking is also done with the same consideration, but there's one thing that makes course ranking a little bit different from a typical item ranking problem. So in a typical user item rating scenario, when a user likes an item, he gives it a high rating. This is not necessarily the case here because a student might like a course very much, but this does not necessarily imply that he's going to get a high grade in that course. And sometimes a student just has to take a course in order to fulfill some degree requirement, regardless of his expected performance in that course. And because of that, course ranking has to be rather based on 
the enrollment patterns in the data and not the actual grade values that we have in, in the data. So now I'm going to talk about how these ideas can be implemented in the existing recommendation techniques, namely popularity-based ranking, user-based collaborative filtering, and matrix factorization. For popularity ranking, what we do is that we rank each course for each student based on how frequently it has been enrolled in by other students in his group. And as I said, since the groups are defined are at multiple levels of granularity, then the model is built using only one group, and that will give us one ranking model. As for user-based collaborative filtering, it generally predicts the grade of a student in a course based on how his neighbors performed in that course. And the key point here is how to select the neighbors. So neighbors are selected as follows. Every student in the same group as the target student is selected as a neighbor, and he must also be, have co-taken a number of similar courses with that student. And then we limit the cardinality of the neighborhood set to make it only include the top most similar neighbors to that user. Once the neighbors are selected, grade prediction is done normally, but when not enough neighbors are found, the, the grade is predicted based on the average student and course grade. As for top end course ranking, neighbors are selected the same way, but we have to convert the, the matrix into a binary matrix the, in order to only account for the enrollment patterns and not the actual grade values. And when not enough neighbors are found, that this actually indicates an irrelevant course and the rank is set to infinity. As for matrix factorization, there are many existing techniques that can be used to implement these ideas. We implement them using a context-aware matrix factorization model that utilizes multiple biases as per the different contexts. So what we do is that we use the student groups to define course-side contexts, and we use the course groups to define student-side contexts, and then we define various contexts as per the different groups, and then the greatest is predicted using the contextual student and course biases, plus the typical dot product between the student and course latent factors. And the model parameters are estimated by minimizing a squared error loss with L2 regularization to avoid overfitting. As I said, since the groups are defined at various levels of granularity, every matrix factorization model will only utilize one student group in one course group, okay? And in general, the number of biases that we are going to have per course would be equal to the number of student groups. And this means that if we utilize the finer, more homogeneous groups, we are probably going to end up having a huge number of biases per course and per student. Most of them are associated with a very few data points that makes it hard to accurately estimate the model parameters, which might lead to poor generalization. So in order to address this problem, we use an ensemble-like approach in which we build different, different matrix factorization models, each utilizing the different granularity groups. Each of them gives its own prediction, and then the predictions are combined based on um, a model specific or a, yes, a model specific way that we learned through another squared error loss minimization function. And it also, there's also another weight that reflects the number of samples that are associated with the, the contextual biases for the particular student course pair that we want to predict. As for top end course ranking, what we do is that we try to maximize a personalized pairwise ranking loss function in which we try to maximize the difference between the ranks of the relevant and irrelevant courses for each student. The relevant courses are the ones that he has taken. The irrelevant ones are the ones that has never been taken by any other student in his group. And the ranking scores themselves are computed using the same formula that incorporates the contextual biases. 
So we evaluated this technique using a data set that was obtained from the University of Minnesota. This data set spanned about 13 academic years. It had about 60,000 students and over 10,000 courses. It had like a reasonable amount of um, student and course academic features. So we experimented with six different ways to define the student and course um, multi-level, multi-granularity groups. So here are the results for top end course ranking. I do not expect you to read all that, but the takeaway message is that for popularity ranking, user-based collaborative filtering, and matrix factorization, utilizing the finer and more homogeneous groups does lead to more accurate course rankings. And it also leads to more accurate course rankings than the response-aware matrix factorization methods from the literature. As for great prediction, utilizing the finer groups only leads to better predictions, more accurate predictions for user-based collaborative filtering. This is not the case for matrix factorization all the time. So matrix factorization methods, the ones that utilize the finer groups, they only lead to more accurate predictions when their biases are associated with a larger number of samples that makes it, you know, that makes us able to actually estimate these biases. And because of that, the best results are actually achieved by the interpolative method in which we combine the predictions of the various matrix factorization methods based on the, based on the sample sizes. And that also outperforms the response aware and the feature-based methods from the literature as well. So I would like to end up with the takeaway message from this work, which is that when it comes to grade prediction and course ranking, then modeling the grouping structures in the data by using the student course academic features to define groups and incorporate them into the prediction and ranking methods does lead to more accurate results. Thank you for listening. I'm ready to take your questions. Talk. Uh, I have a question for you about the model of the user. Yeah. When uh, you want to predict the, say, the, the courses that we will do, uh, you use the other users that in some sense are similar, and you use all the courses that these similar users have, have done in the past. But actually, when they have done that specific course, they have not done all the other courses. Maybe some, all, all, only the courses they've done previously in time. So do you really consider these aspects related with, uh, let's say, user so, model is not the complete, uh, let's say, row of this matrix? So in, in, that's why in, in the user-based collaborative filtering, we also constrain the neighbors uh, such that like, the neighbors must take at least a minimum number of courses as the target user. So they must take, you know, some courses, not just the, the target course. So this is considered in, in user-based collaborative filtering. Um, in matrix factorization, I, I guess the transfer learning just takes care of that. But in, in general, like, if you define the student groups based on the majors, for example, then there would be a large intersection between the courses that are taken by students of the same major anyways. But if you define them, let's say, based on the college, then this, this problem will be more prevalent. And in this case, you're right, like the, we don't get a lot of improvement in, in accuracy. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, I have a question regarding the matrix factorization. So you show that uh, you learn these, those bias terms within the matrix factorization. But then, as you said, we have this not, uh, missing not at random problem, right? So those biases that I learned by your matrix factorization model are on their own are biased due to this not missing at random. So have you looked into this, uh, tried to play around with that? Um, I don't really get the question. So you mean 
the not missing and random property so, is so those, kind of those biases, captured there, right? Yeah, biases for curses, for curses and biases for, uh, well, any biases that you learn within the Maddox facilitation, they are actually averages over, well, approximately averages over columns or rows. But those averages, uh, they are learned on the observed data, which is, uh, which is, and they are not learned on the non-observed data, which misses not at random. So these biases are skewed. They are, they are biased, biased to this. I agree. So, mm -hmm. so they are skewed based on the different groups, and that's exactly what we want to capture. Um, I understand what you mean because the the typical way to model not missing at random is to assume that the probability of not observing a rating depends on the value of that rating. Um, we don't really. Um, so in order to evaluate something like this, you will have to have like. Um, ground truth values for for you know the the, the missing the missing uh, ratings and there are some data sets that are available to test like these kinds of techniques but this will, will never happen in you know in the educational domain like you can't take a student and have him try a course completely outside his field and see what will happen so all we do is that we bias them all what we can do is bias them based on the different groups given what we have, you know? Well, probably you could exploit some side information uh, for learning those propensities of... Like, we, we exploited the these. side information to identify these groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, here. I've been wondering whether, like from my own experience of... From my own experience of studying, might the workload of the student not also impact the grade? Right. Yes, yes, of course. Right, that's, that's definitely another factor, and there are other factors such as um, um, how harsh the grading criteria is and whether the student have peers that can help him, you know, do the projects and assignments and everything. So, yes, there are plenty of other factors that like in this, in this experiments, we did not account for these. But in, in other work that we're still working on, we, we might try to account for these factors as well. <laughs>